Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me at the Christian Minute podcast. My name is Anna Markey, and I'm the host, Christian speaker and author. And I'm joined today by another Anne, and we're actually going to talk about communication and marriage, which is so good. Um, but before we jump in, I'd like to welcome Anne to the show. How's it going? Thank you so much, Anne. It's a pleasure to meet another Anne, and it's a pleasure to be here on the Christian Minute podcast with you. Yeah. So before we kind of jump into our topic today, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. I have been equipping individuals and organizations for over 20 years now to communicate in a way that aligns with their values, you know, so that we're happy tomorrow with the way that we communicate today. And I am a certified John Maxwell coach, speaker, and trainer with For Better Forever, which I co-founded with my husband, Malis. And so I've trained and I've been teaching and coaching in areas of communication and leadership and relationship and mindset and personal growth. But my heart is in communication because it's the lifeblood of relationships. And so it has just led me to speak with uh, students and young people. I have a program that's been written by Dr. John Van Epp. It's called How to Avoid Falling for a Jerk, Everything Relationships. How do we find good people to be with for a lifetime? Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had the opportunity then to uh, go into Paraguay with John Maxwell himself to teach values-based leadership skills and principles to students in Paraguay, which was just uh, the trip of a lifetime. And and then I've had the opportunity to go into our local jail and a recovery home for addicts to, to support them in their sobriety, to change from the inside out in that personal growth piece. And yeah. then in their relationship as well, because their relationships will either support or sabotage their sobriety. And so yeah. today I have a membership for Christian women called the Sisterhood Journey Membership. And there we focus on the four lanes of communication, God talk, self talk, people talk, and leadership talk. And so, oh, awesome. uh, yeah, fun fact, Malis and I have been married for 42 years. And together with his family, we own a potato farm on beautiful Prince Edward Island in Canada. And I'm the mom of five adult kids, but... Uh, I, my favorite title of all time is I'm a Nana. I'm a Nana to 11 amazing grandchildren. So, wow. Yeah. I love talking to older women and kind of getting their advice and, you know, like guidance when it comes to kids and marriage. And yeah, it sounds like you've had so, so many amazing opportunities and just chances to like, not just learn, but teach. And yeah, I'm excited to kind of jump in and see, the kind of wisdom you can share about communication. I, I'm excited to be here with you. And I think there's so much um, opportunity to, uh, to love one another better yeah. by the way that we communicate better. So. Yeah. Yeah. So to get started, I'd love to talk about maybe some of the, like, what are some of the most common communication challenges you see in couples? If I could share with you how I got started, because this is why I do what I do. And yeah. it's one of the challenges that we all face in communication. And it's one of the reasons why we got into trouble in our marriage. But we didn't start out that way, of course. <laughs> I shamelessly chased this young man. I was 15. I just wanted a date. And then three years later, we married. And the photographer said to us, I've never seen a couple look at each other the way the two of you look at each other. Because mm. we were crazy in love. <laughs> Yeah. And isn't love enough? <laughs> and then um, he was new to farming. He often came home frustrated and didn't know how to communicate about that. And then I was pregnant one month after we were married. And so then we had five children in six years. Wow. So we had these external pressures, but then we had these internal yeah. pressures because I didn't know how to communicate about what was happening to me. I often felt alone, like I was a single mom raising these kids when he had his very busy seasons. And so we also avoided conflict. And this, these two things, not communicating and avoiding conflict, created an emotional space, a, a distance in our marriage. And it was, it kind of snuck up on us. It didn't happen right away. It kind of snuck up on us. And so all of a sudden we got a, like, it was like I woke up one day and it was like, wait a minute, I don't know who you are anymore. And mm. who are we? Because we're so busy. 
but then we're not communicating well. And then I remember the moment that changed everything for us. And we were on a date. We were sitting in our farm truck outside our favorite restaurant. And I looked at him and I said, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I can't do marriage like this anymore. And I said, we just keep going around and around the same old thing. We never solve anything or resolve anything. And I'm so tired and I'm so hurt. That conversation opened him up and he started to share his pain and I had missed his pain. I think because I was so busy caring for our kids and I was in my own mess that yeah. I missed I missed his pain, but he opened up to me that night and he shared what was going on for him. And we recommitted to each other. We're going to get the help that we need in order to get well. And I tell my people, it's the bravest and best thing you can do in the world is to get help. And I think yeah. we all need it at some point. And so when I work with pre-married couples to help them get ready, I say, you know, go sooner than later. Don't don't do what we did and wait for 15 years before you get help. Go sooner and get help. Get the help that you need in order to get well. So you don't have so much garbage to go through, so much pain yeah. uh, before you get the help that you need. And so uh, very soon, and we started to fall in love again and we found each other and we said, we can't keep this to ourselves. We have to share right. this with other people. Yeah. And that put us on the path. And so the very skills and tools that I teach people and many of the challenges that we faced within our own marriage, we've discovered are some of the very same challenges that others face. And one of those is that vulnerability piece. Like mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I can trust you with my heart. And yes. so I'm not going to share my heart with you. I'm not going to share this piece of me with you because I'm scared. Yeah. I'm afraid that I'm yeah. not safe with you. And it may seem strange that you can live with somebody for many, many years and yet not feel that safety. But trust is something that kind of moves. It's a bit on, it's on a slider. And yeah. so you hurt me a little bit today and my trust kind of falls. Yeah. Or I'm reminded of something way back when and my trust plummets because yeah. I'm not sure I can trust you. So I'm not going to be vulnerable with you. And it was one of the very first marriage lessons we learned and communication lessons. The deeper you go into communication, as in fe sharing feelings and needs, that's more vulnerable. It's riskier. And that's where we were not going. And that's why we felt that space and that distance in our yeah. lives. Okay, so we are, <clears throat> excuse me, we're actually, my husband and I are approaching our 15 year anniversary. So I think it's interesting that you shared that number 15, because this past year, I have for sure noticed that our, our life, like we're, we're starting a different phase, like all the kids now are in full time school, I'm working a little bit more, you know, like things have shifted. But also at the 15 year mark, and I think you said this was that like, that's sometimes how long it takes for these things to build up. So they're just like small things over time that you just don't necessarily take notice of or deal with in that moment. But then by the time you get to the 15 mark, now you have this like whole field of things that just have piled up. And I think that it's an easy thing to get frustrated because you have lower patience, you have a lot more memory of like the list of things that just haven't been working. And so I think it's interesting that it was like at the 15 year mark that you were like, I can't do this anymore. Cause I think that's, it's exactly that you've gone through this, the, the like young kid years, <laughs> you know, you've survived those years and now you're maybe starting to become more of yourself again. And yes. it's easy to kind of, lose those other things in that process. Absolutely. And the list, oh my goodness, it can get yeah. long, right? And we call it short accounts. And that's one tip that I would give your people, keep short accounts. Don't let the yeah. list get long. And so, and we were letting the list get long. And one of yeah. the, another reason why, Anne, is because I wanted to keep the peace. I yes. don't like to fight. I am like a people pleasing, agreeable person. And you think that would be easy to live with, but uh -uh. <laughs> not no. so easy to live with because you can't know people unless we share what's in our heart and what's going yeah. on. And so yeah. it turned, as it turns out, my husband is also peace loving. And so we weren't conflicting 
in ways yeah. that actually could bring us closer together. And one of the first, the second marriage lesson we learned was that conflict is the doorway to intimacy. I As love that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, although the first time I heard it, I threw the book across the room. Because <laughs> I think, because I think when we hear the word conflict, we automatically think about yelling and screaming and like, just very volatile, you know? Yes. And, and as Christians, we're, we're told constantly, unity, peace, love, all those things. And so sometimes they're very opposing things. And so maybe tell us a little bit more about what you mean by conflict. <laughs> Great question. And I think you are absolutely right that we think about those big volatile moments, yeah. Yeah. but conflict is, a, it, and we're taught to be nice. Yes. Be the good Christian girl, be the good church girl. And yeah. so that idea of creating some conflict, because I don't agree with that. I actually think this way. We don't have to go to the mat for everything, but when it's important uh, to one or the other, those are things we do want to go to the mat for. Like right now, I'm not feeling like you're respecting me because I shared this with you yesterday and you shared that with our friends and I wasn't prepared to tell our friends about that. That would be a reason to go to the mat. And by by going to the mat, it just means having that conversation about, you know, I'm I don't feel that's that feeling. I don't feel respected because this happened. And what I really want is that that's an important piece too. And often we don't know what we want. We can't yeah. tell somebody else what we want if we don't know what it is that we want. And what I really want is I want you to kind of check in with me and you're not telling my story outside of what we've agreed that builds trust, right? And commitment to you that yeah your story is your story and I'll only reveal it as you are comfortable with revealing your story to other people. So that those are good reasons to enter into, we call them pivotal conversations because yes. they create some sort of shift or change in the relationship in some way, because, um, um, perhaps you're giving, perhaps one partner is giving dirty looks, right? Okay, it's the look like what what is that look what yeah I feel like I've displeased you and I'm not sure what's going on or what's happening there's a good reason just to say you know, what's going on what is that yeah. look and uh my husband actually he um we went through this process where he was giving the look and and we have three daughters and our girls were saying dad you're, there's the look again and he was saying I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm good. I, I don't know what's happening here. He did the most amazing thing, Anne. And this is one way that we can be more self-aware of what's going on inside. He said, okay, here's the deal. I want you to tell me when I'm giving you the look and I'm going to figure out what this look is that I'm actually giving you. And he did that. And now no more look, Anne, no more look. Oh, awesome. I Yeah, I, I feel too. It's like, I called our first year of marriage. I felt it was like, we're defining the terms here. <laughs> you know, like we were saying specific words that we understood a certain way, but they didn't. And so there wasn't quite understanding, but your story makes me think of too, like maybe it's like character traits or things that you're doing with your face that you're like, are you actually mad at me? But if you don't become curious and we just ask, we just assume, oh, they're really angry. But then when we check in, it's like, oh, no, sorry. That's just my face. <laughs> we had this conversation in our membership and one of the women said, I give that, I give something. I don't know what it is. And so we talked about the resting face. So we actually have a resting face. And and for, for some of us, it's harder than for other of us to give kind of that welcome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what you're talking about there. <laughs> yeah. And so I think in that instance, it's like, I love that your husband was able to kind of change that look. Um, but also something that I try and do is like, okay, if my husband is looking this way, I have to remember he's telling me he's not actually mad with that look. He's feeling this other thing. But either way, you're still having a conversation about it. So you both understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes when there is that look, it's, it is just a check in, you know, are you okay? 
what's happening yeah. for you today and yeah. and then that opens it up to a pivotal conversation perhaps maybe there is something going on maybe there there's been a hard day today that we haven't yet discussed and maybe that gives opportunity to get to know one another better um there's all that that knowing never ever stops and i love that about relationship that it's not going to be the same in five years that it is today because we're going to have new experiences i yeah. still remember when out we had our first granddaughter here in our mm -hmm. location and watching my husband become an opa that's that's dutch for grandfather watching him become an opa to a little girl that was oh. here was yeah. uh, the most beautiful thing and a and a more knowing again about his heart and yeah. and seeing that tenderness that he had toward her yeah yeah i love that and i think that's some of the, one of the things that i'm learning in marriage is that there are seasons and seasons you know they change and like you said, we, we get different experiences. And so that sometimes changes the way we look at things. Or um, I'm a huge fan of like the love language book. Yes. But when I, when I first read that book, I just thought love languages stayed the same. And what I've been learning is that like, oh, actually my love language has changed. And so I have to be able now to communicate that because maybe he's still remembering when we were first married and how I needed love then, but I haven't updated him <laughs> on what I need from him now. And so if I know what that change is, then saying, Hey honey, like I really, you know, I would feel more loved if this, this, and this. And so it's just like, it's not just a one and done conversation. It's this like continual expressing of how we're feeling, but also how we're changing and like how we can change with each other in those moments. Mm, I love that, Anne. And, and you'd mentioned little children, like when we have little children, uh, there might be more like action. Yeah. Uh, I, I need you to help with the dishes. I need you to help get dinner on the table. I need you to feed the baby, you know, you know, whatever that is more action than, and, or if someone is sick, um, maybe touch is hard because maybe it's painful. Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember when I was down with a very sore neck. I was down for eight months in, and uh, oh, wow. it was very debilitating. I couldn't hold a book. I couldn't ride mm -hmm. in the car because any movement hurt. And so I, I couldn't hug. And touch right. is my number one love language. I love it. But I couldn't hug at that time. And so you're right. It's so different circumstances and situations require an ongoing conversation about where are you now? Like what's happening yeah. in your day or in this season for you that we know how to love one another, whether it's words of affirmation or touch or uh, action or gifts. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, so you've already covered the first step of how we can start this conversation. And I'll just remind people, it's kind of like that self-awareness, but once we kind of have an idea of what's happening in our own emotions or feelings, can you give us some tips maybe of like how we can start these hard conversations with our spouse? Mm. And so, by the way, we call it the three C's of pivotal conversation. So that first one is check emotion and that awareness of knowing what's going on inside of me, what's happening, because we can sabotage a conversation if I am emotionally charged and I don't know why or I don't know what's going on or why is this so important to me, this conversation. So we call that check emotions and check motives, by the way. I think our hearts are so slippery. I need to know, like, am I punishing you here because I don't like what you said yesterday? Or am I a little bit like, am I getting, am I finding some resentment in my heart here because um, I'm angry with you or upset with you? So we have a whole journaling process to help our people check emotions. Okay. And I, I love that ability to be able to check in with myself and be aware of what's happening inside. That gets me ready for that next step, that second C, which we call communicate and clarify. And so some of the principles there is once I know where I'm coming from, I find it helps to settle down those emotions. So I can actually come to the conversation kind of a clean slate, although there's something yeah. that's important that we need to talk about. I'm ready to actually listen. Yeah. I'm ready to share what it is that I need to share with you concisely and clearly. And I think that's really important. We don't give somebody a whole mountain full of words 
when there's a really important point that needs to be made. I don't want to make you search for the point. Mm. I want to be clear and concise. And with that journaling process, I can be really clear about this is how I feel. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm really worried about here. Um, you know, I've, I've, when things go wrong, we can think, oh, we're headed for divorce court because our friends are there, right? So we go to, we catastrophize it and we go to the absolute worst possible scenario. And that may be what I'm worrying about, but really that's not where we're going here. And so just journaling that out, then I can be able to clearly and concisely say, this is what I feel. This is what I'm worried about. This is what I want. Mm. And then invite the dialogue because we don't want it to just be a monologue we want to hear their heart too and mm. so invite tell me about you and then that word you used earlier is curiosity it, to stay in that place of curiosity even if i don't agree with what you're saying but to stay there in that place of curiosity to get to the gold and we call the gold is the sound of a person's heart opening up mm -hmm. yeah right? i love that you have a whole journaling process. Cause I feel like that I I'm not a great journaler, but I, I internalize like my process is all internal and I find it's similar. You're thinking about like, okay, he's not taking out the garbage. I know that's not what I'm angry about, but what is it specifically? And then, cause sometimes it's really easy to blame, you know, like our anger goes towards the people that are in proximity to us, but they're not necessarily the cause of those things. Cause it could be external things. And so like taking that minute to really see like, oh, I'm not actually mad at them. <laughs> I'm just choosing to be mad at them because I wasn't able to be mad when I was, you know, like at the thing I'm actually frustrated at. Um, so I love that you have a whole process where it's really like trying to clarify the specific issue that you're facing. Yes. And I think it's so incredibly valuable to... Um, to be able to know what's happening inside of me. I find that once I journal through that, a pivotal conversation sometimes is done in no time. Okay. It's not a big deal like I thought it was. And right. the other person is ready for the conversation. They didn't even know it was coming, but it's not a big deal to them maybe, or perhaps yeah. it is. And then it becomes a bigger conversation, which can be okay to have, yeah. which no, let me say that differently. It's essential to have yeah. those pivotal conversations, to go deeper in relationship. For sure. And I think, you know, one of the things I've learned in the 15 years of our marriage is my husband and I have very different processing times. And I don't want to say systems, but the way we process things. Yeah. And so he can take a lot longer. So sometimes what I've done is I'll say to him, so I'm thinking about this and I want to talk to you about this, but can we talk about this in a week or two? So I'm kind of giving him a heads up. So he has time to like, think about the thing I want to talk about. <laughs> so that by the time we actually sit down, he's already processed. So then I'm not getting frustrated because he hasn't processed anything. And so that was like, so key in our relationship was just to learn that patience. Um, and I do it more, you know, like instead of outburst in that moment of frustration, you know, like stepping back, processing, giving them time to process. And then by the time, like you said, by the time you both come to the table, it's like a two minute conversation because you're both ready. You both know what you're thinking. You both know you love each other. And it's so much easier, actually. There's so much love in that, Anne. And I love that you give him the time to, to think about what is important to him and what's really going on for him. And yeah. that's a beautiful example of knowing uh, your husband well and knowing that about him and being patient enough to give him that space uh, to be able to understand his own heart so that he can come to the table fully equipped and ready for that conversation that you want to have. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure some people would disagree with me, but, you know, sometimes I've had to put timelines in being like, I kind of need your answer within a specific timeline um, because he's the type of person that could think about something forever without doing anything. <laughs> yes. And so instead of being front, like instead of turning that into a frustration, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I know this. And so giving a timeline is actually going to be more beneficial 
because then he'll actually have to make a decision versus about just leaving it open forever. Right. Well, and there's love again. And because there is such a thing as decision fatigue. Yeah. And if that goes on for an extended period of time, then it continues to kind of percolate in his brain and in his head. And that gives a timeline so that it can be then talked about and put away. Because more yeah. often those conversations can be put away. They're, they're finished, deleted. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think um, I'm just, I was like, I, I totally lost my train of thought there. I was, <laughs> what I was going to ask. That. Okay. Yes. And now I'm remembering. So sometimes, even though, you know, I'm, I'm never perfect in these things. And sometimes maybe we have the good intentions and we've had some self-reflections and we're doing all the things that we're talking about and we're starting to have those conversations. But as we're talking, our emotions kind of come up again and can kind of get in the way. Do you have any tips on how we can handle our own emotions when we're either thinking about ourselves or having these conversations? Mm -hmm. A couple of things. Um, number one is to be aware of, mm -hmm. okay, I've just been triggered here and I'm going over the top. And if I get to that place, then I know it's better for me to take a timeout, give myself a timeout. <laughs> if I'm triggered and I'm going over the top, I just need to say, you know what? I need to revisit this, but can we do it tomorrow? Can we do it later tonight? Um, mm -hmm. Give a timeline. Like you said, I love a timeline. Um, so that they know we're going to come back to this because I know it's important to you, but to give myself time to give my body time to kind of settle down because it takes 30 minutes for our, like our body to actually settle down. Our heart rate rises, their blood pressure uh, can go through the roof. And so it takes time to, so 30 minutes at least uh, a good walk can help to bring that down and it can help you to think too, because you get the blood moving. And so that's an incredible way to be able to give yourself a timeout. It's not a punishment for the other person. It, I need a timeout. Yes. But then if you're in the middle of it and you know you're starting to get upset, but you don't need a timeout, I find it incredibly helpful just to listen. Mm. And it is the hardest skill in the world. It is completely underrated. We do not have many places where people listen to us where people don't interject their own ideas or their own stories or their own uh, their own perspective or opinions. And so just to sit back and listen. Mm. And I call it the secret sauce of summarizing to help me stay there. So I'm thinking about, okay, this, and by the way, these are um, from Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference. And he's an FBI negotiator, but this is incredibly powerful. You can use it at home. It sounds like, it seems like, mm. it looks like. So it sounds like you're frustrated because things aren't going well at work and employees aren't coming in on time. And then you don't have enough people to do the work that needs to be done. And you're kind of bringing that home. It, like, it seems like you're kind of bringing that home. And, and it looks like you're, you've got that angry face at home. It's incredibly yeah. helpful to feed back what you're seeing to the other person so they get to see what you see. It helps me to listen really closely, to really get into his shoes, to hear his heart, to hear the sound of his heart opening up. I remember a time when my daughter did this for me. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, we were sitting at the kitchen table and I needed to have a conversation with our son. And I just blurted out to her, I just don't trust him. Mm. And she looked at me and she said, mom, that's awful. You have to do something with that. <laughs> I knew as soon as it was out of my mouth, I had a problem. I was, I yeah. knew, <laughs> I love God. I knew that, and I knew that he, my son, wasn't in that place. He was a trustworthy young man. So what was going on with me? I needed to go to my thinking chairs where I meet with Papa, my heavenly father. I needed to get there with him and journal through those questions. And I didn't even finish that journaling process before I realized, oh, I am stuck back in 2005 when we had some challenges raising this young man 
and yes. he's not there anymore. And so yes. this was incredible. When we listen to each other, it's the sound of a person's heart. That was gold. That's the gold we look for. When we listen, we actually hear what's happening or going on for the other person. Yeah, I love that. And I, I know for us, like for me, it's really hard and I don't like to give it as excuse, but um, with my ADHD brain, it's really hard just to like not interject. <laughs> um, and so it's, it really is, it makes you a little bit more alert and watchful because you're like, no, I'm going to literally like bite my tongue. So that giving you the space to talk. But I also love that you said, you know, if you need that time out to give it to yourself, and I know my husband and I haven't had this issue. Like we haven't had to step away in a conversation for time out. But I know like for my daughter, she's 13 and um, we can go quite head to head. <clears throat> and so I finally came to a place of realizing like we can't continue having these same conversation patterns. It's not helpful for either one of us. So I said to her, <clears throat> next time you get frustrated, instead of yelling and screaming, you have a free pass to walk away, mm. go calm down. And then I'll come like, I'll come find you in, later. I usually give my kids about 20 minutes. Um, but now that you're saying 30, I'm like, oh, that actually makes sense. <laughs> but I think it's, you know, part of that realization of like, okay, they need some space to calm down. I need a space to calm down. Let's give each other permission so that when I walk away, you're not getting angry because I'm walking away, but because we've already agreed that that's something we can do. Mm. I love that you've set that up before it happens because then it's already in motion and you both know that this is the moment, this is it, and it's okay to be able to give, your, to give yourself that time. Uh, yeah. And it's okay on the other person's part too. You may be upset, but we're gonna give ourselves both some space to be able to figure out what's going on and to calm down. And by the way, that's the third C is to create we solutions. And you did that with your daughter by creating that solution, by giving her kind of permission or giving her, her the ability to be able to walk away when she's upset. Yeah, and I for sure have forgotten that I gave her full permission to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so she's even said like, well, mom, what if you forget? <laughs> and so I'm like, well, you could calmly remind me. So there's been like a couple times where she's like, mom, remember you told me I could walk away. And I'm like, right, I did. Okay, thank you. And so we're both learning, but it's just, I think that admission that we're not perfect, you know, and I think with our spouse, it's easy to think that we're right, they're wrong. Um, but just realizing like, oh no, like I could be the, like I could be causing the issue just in the way we're communicating. I'm not always going to be right. You know, let's give each other space. And I think that's helpful. Um, and I know it's been helpful with my relationship with my kids. And I'm sure some people do have those heated arguments with their spouse. And so hopefully that can help them in that kind of relation. Yes, incredible to be able to give yourself a time out to be able to, to walk away and to calm down so that you can come back to the conversation again. I encourage my people, don't just walk away. Let them know, I am I need a time out here and we're going to come back to this and give a time frame yeah. for which you come back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I know that as a counselor, do you frame things like through scripture? Are you specifically a, like a Christian counselor or what are you bringing into that? Yes, I am a coach, first of all. I do believe there's a difference and I stick with my lane as a coach. Yeah. And so, yes, absolutely. My membership is for Christian women. I love working with Christian women I and Christian couples. I think we can do better in the church. Yes in relationships. Yeah. There's too many, there's too, too many of us give up so soon. Um, and when they're, every relationship goes through hard times, but it doesn't mm. mean the end. It means we can get better. And I believe that it's in the rough of that, that iron sharpens iron and that God makes us better. And he shapes our character through hard times and having that humility to be able to say, God, 
on my knees. I need help. I don't know how to do this. And just yeah. leaning into him to get that guidance and that leading from Holy Spirit and from scripture. I think it's incredibly necessary for me as a woman of faith. And so one of some of my favorite scriptures around communicate, there are so many Proverbs is full of instruction on how to communicate. But, yeah. you know, uh, we talked about checking emotions and motives. And in Proverbs um, 16, it, he talks about, you know, all a person's ways seem pure to him. But motives are weighed by the Lord. And that's why we need God to shine a light on our motives. Like, what is happening in my heart here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to get back at you because I don't like you right now. <laughs> I need to know that before I go into the conversation, right? Or yeah. then another proverb is um, the, the tongue has the power yes. of life and death. Yeah. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Mm -hmm. So we have like the tongue is so powerful. So the words that I speak, which is why it's so important to check our emotions and to check our motives, because we don't want to go into a pivotal conversation all fired up and just like have a trigger happy tongue because it has the power of death in it and the power of life. So we can speak life into our spouses and our children with the words that we speak over them. Totally. I agree. I remember this was like within a month of getting married. Um, I had come home from work and my husband needed to go to a game without me. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, go, you know, like go to your game. And I just assumed he'd come home right after. Um, but so then he wasn't coming home and I called him and he's like, oh yeah, we like decided to go out. And I, it really triggered my anger and I was like mm -hmm. livid. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just hanging up and just like stewing in that anger and just being like, I could just feel the evil inside of me. Just like, I'm going to mm. hurt this person. And the Lord really helped me in that moment. And how he spoke to me was like, Anne, if you, if your husband walks in the door right now, and this is how you greet him, you will destroy your marriage in this moment right here, right now. Mm. And then like this, this call from the Lord saying, and you don't, you do actually love this person. You don't want to destroy him. So I'm going to help you calm down kind of thing. And that was such a good lesson that, like you said, our words can be so powerful. And if we are not careful as to how we use them, how we speak to our spouses, we can be destroying something really beautiful because it can, we don't want to have it just be one more thing that adds to the pile and suddenly it's, you can't fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, my, my cat is like wanting to come visit. So, <laughs> I love that you're willing to lean into God and to hear Him speak. You know, my sheep hear my voice. Yeah. I believe that He speaks to us and He leads us, and we need to listen and we need to follow Him and and His wisdom through His Word and by the Holy Spirit. It's just it's essential for us as godly people. It's not a, it's kind of like the I do that we said on, on, you know, our wedding days, it's I do on the wedding day, but then it's I do every day. <laughs> it's commitment. Yeah. And it's the same for God. Like it's I do the moment we met Jesus Christ as our savior, but then it's I do every day again. <laughs> we walk it out. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And I love that you give that example because that's exactly what it is. I mean, his, the biggest picture of Christ's love for us is of, the groom and the bride. And so it really does our relationship with our spouse is a representation of God's love for the church. And so, you know, I really take that very solemnly and think about, okay, what, what are people, how are seeing, how are people seeing God and his relationship to his bride in my marriage? And if I'm not being a loving wife, then what is that saying about the church? And so there's quite like, it's deep. Like God is so deep. <laughs> and that's a little bit of heaven on earth, right? Our yeah. homes can be a little bit of heaven on earth. Not perfect, far from perfect. We're not looking for perfection, but they can be a little bit of heaven on earth in that love that we share with one another and care for one another, especially in our way we communicate with one another and the way we connect. Because when we communicate well, it helps us to connect deeply. Yeah.
Yeah. Now, do you, when you were sharing your story, you mentioned it was like on a date night that you had this kind of conversation that opened things up. Do you practice like weekly date nights or like weekly conversation ritual, not rituals, but just patterns that kind of help you sustain this? We have rhythms of connecting. And so every day we have certain habits, marriage mm -hmm. habits that we do that help us stay connected, weekly habits that we do, and then yearly habits where we go uh, away for a time. And we often read a book. We usually read a marriage book while we're away. By the way, we're kind of nerdy that way. <laughs> but for us, it's like maintenance. It's like... Um, you, you take your car in, you take your teeth into the dentist for your yearly checkup. It's like our yearly checkup. And I love it. We both look forward to it. And so the daily check-ins are in the morning, we have coffee together and we pray together. And mm. it's some of my favorite time that we get to just sit together and, and just, um, I get to hear his heart in prayer too, and what's on his mind for the day. And then we take time to pray for our kids too, which is inc incredibly, uh, it's, it's a responsibility that I feel we have as parents to bring our kids and our grandchildren to the Lord. And then the second daily um, marriage habit that we have is every night we check in with each other with a simple exercise. I love it because it's simple and it's easy to remember in the beginning. It was easy to remember, but now we've been doing it for uh, over 15 years. Um, and it's simply that we ask one another at the end of the day, what was the high point of your day? What was the low point of your day? What do you appreciate about me today? And we ask oh. those questions. There is something so powerful about saying and humil like humbling to say, what do you appreciate about me today? <laughs> and then we finish with what was your God moment of the day? And it's amazing that after 42 years of marriage, there's still more to learn. Sometimes it's the same. He yeah. it's often his high point is either about food. He loves that I cook and I love to be in the kitchen, or it's about, uh, uh, or it's about, it's about food or it's about, uh, it could be about our prayer time. He loves that time in the morning. Um, but not too long ago, we had had a whole evening together. And when I asked him that at the end of the night, what was your low point of the day? He had had three big things that happened to him in that day at work that he hadn't told me about yet. Mm. Yeah. Because for him, it was kind of packed away and it was at work and it was gone. Yeah. But if we, if we hadn't asked that question and if we hadn't, if we didn't do that exercise, I probably wouldn't have known yeah. that those three things happened to him that day. Right. And so I love their moments of intimacy that we share with one another, that we treasure that moment. It takes maybe 10 minutes of yeah. conversation. It's not long, but I, we love it. And so we have this rhythm of connecting so that we don't get to the place. We also have short accounts where when things come up, we deal with it right then and there. We don't let it build. Um, and so when he asks me what's wrong, I am not supposed to say nothing, <laughs> nothing, yeah, nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And so we have this agreement that we're going to keep those short accounts. We don't let it build. We don't get it, let it get to the point where we're getting resentful. So we have yeah. those piv little pivotal conversations weekly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that because I, I mean, it's funny because we learned this actually quite early on in our, like, it was like a week after we got engaged, we had like never had an argument. And like one week after we got engaged, um, he had done something and, you know, it's like the whole game of like, I'm not going to talk to you, but I want you to come find me, but I'm not going to tell you that I want you to come find me. And then when you don't come find me, I'm going to get angry with you kind of thing. Yep. Um, and I was like, oh, my goodness, we have to like, we can't get married. This is ridiculous. Like, this, but, you know, it just like built up. Anyways, we obviously came back together. We talked about it. But he's like, I don't play those games. So just don't do it. I was like, OK, and haven't since. <laughs> but it's like it's that again, going back to identifying the things that you just will not put up with. Right. But then able to then say those things in a way that aren't demeaning, like the way he told me, I don't like that wasn't mean. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't rude. It was just like, 
I, I can't actually read your mind, Anne, and I want to know what you're thinking. So just tell me. And I was like, right. Okay. <laughs> you know? And so when, and then when you have those set up, you know, maybe when you're first starting to like apply those things to how you treat each other, you have to remind yourself. But over time, it's like, we just naturally don't go do that anymore because we've just, it's been so many years now that it's just natural. And so I think it's a good reminder for people that, you know, at the beginning, those changes might be hard and it's going to take more intention and it might feel a little bit laborsome, but as you continue to do it, it just becomes easier. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, Anne, we're setting up a system, which is not very romantic, but we're actually setting yeah. up a system for how we're going to communicate, how we're going to disagree, how we're going to spend our money, how we're going to worship. Is it a daily thing? Is it a weekly thing? Is it a priester thing? Like we go to church on Christmas and Easter, um, yeah. how we worship, uh, all of that, how we deal with in-laws. We're setting up a system for how we do life together. And so it's incredibly important, I think, to have mentors in our lives who are further along than we are, who can help us to set up healthy systems uh, mm. so that we also have people to go to when we are struggling or when we're challenged or not doing well. Yeah. And I, it's interesting that you use the word system because I think sometimes it, like you said, it doesn't feel romantic, but it's like, right. But don't you feel more loved when things are intentional? And that's, I feel like what systems, they help you be more intentional. And mm -hmm. I feel like, can you, maybe some people don't quite understand the term like systems and communication. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe just give us an example of a system you mean for mm -hmm. that communication? And I had already given you this, the, the, a sample of uh, uh, how to connect in daily yeah. through prayer time and coffee. So connecting both with God and with each other. And then that high, low appreciation, but that's a system that we have uh, in order to stay connected on a daily basis, going away on holiday and taking a marriage book with us. It's, it's a system. It's a yearly thing, a yearly check-in yeah. that we do to stay connected, making some agreements um, like you did with your daughter that's a system for how we're going to agree with or how we're going to get along when we're not getting along we're going to take a yeah. we're going to take a break and yeah. so that's that's part of a system for how we will do a conflict or disagreements yeah. um so those are some ideas of how we set up a system uh, how we communicate about finances whether we sit down daily weekly monthly or yearly and how we who pays the bills who makes the money those are all systems within the financial so there's just a multitude yeah. of systems that are set up in the beginning yeah for sure and i think too it's just remembering that every marriage the systems are going to look different mm -hmm. but also i find over time you sometimes need to add systems um yes. i found lately we've been just having more disagreements about how we discipline the children. And mm -hmm. so we had to just come to a point where it was like, okay, before we give out a specific consequence, let's just check in, make sure we're on the same page and then move forward and mm -hmm. kind of doing that in front of the kids. So they watched us and like, we weren't Uber, like we weren't screaming, but we weren't a hundred percent calm, but it was just like yeah. this system, the way we're talking about discipline isn't working. What can we do so that it can work so that we're not both frustrated the next time this happens? Um, mm -hmm. And I and I was like very intentional about doing that in front of the kids. And my, my daughter was like, I don't like it when you guys do that. And I was like, right. But you need to see how real marriage people communicate. <laughs> mm -hmm. But just that, you know, like that was a brand new system because beforehand, we never really disagreed a lot on uh, discipline. And so it was just like a new, just something we had been facing more and more that finally is like, no, we need a new way to talk about this because this isn't working. And that's why that communication piece is so important, Dan, because life is changing all the time. So yeah. now you have a 13 year old in the house. They're not two anymore. And yeah. so they've grown and they're changing the way they interact with you. And so that's why it's so important to uh, be able to communicate about these things, revisit the system that's not working yeah. right now and adjust it to create a we solution, which is our yeah. third C of pivotal conversations.
No, I love it. And I, I think there's so much wisdom in that. And um, yeah, I could probably talk all day about communication, but I know you've given us so much to think about and I really appreciate it. And I know you've told us a little bit about your program. So if anybody is interested to learn more, where can they find you online? Absolutely. I, my name is Ann Visser and I'm at forbetterforever.com. And I am, we have a website. Uh, we also are on Facebook. Uh, and you can connect with me there or through my email as well, Anne, without an E, at forbetterforever.com. And um, I would invite anyone to join us for that, uh, our membership. We uh, love to have uh, new people in the membership. Uh, there's two different levels to the membership right now the gold membership is open and it's a simple online step-by-step -step, uh, communication membership program we talk about the four lanes of communication god talk self-talk people talk and, le and leadership talk they're just bite-sized trainings uh, that teaches you the essential skills for communication we have downloadables to help uh, with worksheets and practical tools to help you communicate it takes away the overwhelm it takes away the uncertainty for how do i apply this to my life and and you gain the support of a small private facebook group as well with positive like-minded christian women who they're going to cheer you on because that's essential in our group is that we keep a positive mindset as we work together to grow and our women are just growing exponentially it is amazing to be a part of this program and a part of this group uh, these women love the lord and they want to communicate in a way that they love so that tomorrow they're happy with the way they communicated today I love that. And I'll make sure to add those links in the show notes. So if anybody is interested, they can come find you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with me. I know it's been super helpful for me and I hope I know it'll be super helpful for many others. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Ann. It's a privilege to meet you and uh, wish you all the best on your podcasting on the Christian Minute podcast. And just may it go out to many people and bless many people with your work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining and I'll see you next time in our next episode. Bye.